now more than ever, people need to go within and plug into that cellular memory, plug into divine source, detach as much as possible from the matrix. Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, our very special guest is Lon Strickler. Lon is a Fortean researcher, author, and intuitive who writes and mentors on a variety of subjects. Lon is a resident of Hanover, Pennsylvania. At an early age, Lon realized that he had the ability to sense spiritual energy and found this useful in the field when conducting investigations. Most of his early field work concentrated on spiritual activity at historical locations, in particular the Gettysburg and Antietam battlefields. In 1981, Lon experienced a Bigfoot encounter near Sykesville, Maryland, while fishing on the south branch of the Patapsco River. As a result of the incident, he included cryptids as an important part of his research. Lon started the Phantoms and Monsters blog in 2005, which has steadily grown in popularity and read daily by thousands of paranormal enthusiasts, investigators, and those seeking the truth. Lon's research has been featured on hundreds of online media sources. Several of these published reports have been presented on various television segments, including the History Channel's Ancient Aliens, Sci-Fi's Paranormal Witness, Fact or Faked, Paranormal Files, and Destination America's Monsters and Mysteries in America. As well, he has been interviewed on several radio broadcasts, including multiple guest appearances on Coast to Coast AM. He was also featured on Destination America's Monsters and Mysteries in America television show for the Sykesville Monster episode. In 2014, Lon and Sean Forker founded Arcane Radio, in which they both host with Butch Witkowski. And Lon's websites are phantomsandmonsters.com and arcaneradio.com. So without any further ado, Lon Strickler, welcome to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. How are you doing, James? This is really a pleasure, and I really appreciate you coming on the show because I feel it's a benefit to our listeners that they get a full understanding of the cryptid situation, i.e. those animals which have not been officially categorized, classified by mainstream zoology. So for the benefit of our listeners, Lon, can you tell us a bit about your background and how you got into uh, this important work you're doing? Well, this kind of started back when I was young. One day I happened to be on the Gettysburg battlefield, which I lived near, and for whatever reason I was picking up on a lot of weird anomalies, seeing apparitions, hearing basically uh, what sounded like a battle. And what I later realized was I was intuitive and I was able to pick up spirit energy. So I used this, uh, as I got older, to actually start doing paranormal investigations. Now, this was the uh, the late 70s, so back then, paranormal investigating was not really that well-known or even popular, but I would make inquiries, or eventually people started coming to me to come and check what was going on on a location. So... I did that for several years. I had moved to Maryland right after I got out of high school, and uh, I lived outside of Baltimore for actually 40 years, and I just moved back to Pennsylvania about a year and a half ago. Well, anyway, I uh, I was one day, 1981, I was fishing on the uh, south bank of the uh, well, south fork of the Patapsco River in Sykesville, Maryland, and had a had a Bigfoot encounter, and after that occurred, and after I got interested and started doing some of my own investigation, I started focusing on cryptid activity as well. So uh, that led to a few things, and after a while, I I had been gathering stories for years, and uh, somebody actually said to me, he said, you know, you ought to start a blog, and this is back in 2005. And uh, that's how I started Phantoms and Monsters. Well, what's interesting is this planet we live on. Uh, We humans like to think that we're at the top of the heap. 
we like to think that <laughs> we basically own this planet and there's no one around except us. But when one goes back and checks out the lore of the various indigenous cultures going back clear into ancient times, there have been persistent and consistent stories about what we now call cryptids, these humanoid type beings that look somewhat mammalian uh, to cite w but one example uh, like the dogman very common reports these days the sasquatch what have you not too long ago my partner and I got lost on a kind of lonely mountain road and we saw this small humanoid uh, short furred being kind of flit across our headlights it was uh, doing a sidestep real fast across the street uh, the road in this deserted mountain and we both screamed at the same time and I didn't want to ask my partner what she had seen because I actually didn't want her to confirm that she'd seen what I'd seen it was only you know after a couple of days we did a debrief you know when you, we both screamed up on that mountaintop uh, I saw this little being come out laterally from the left to the right real fast and she freaked out because she had seen the same thing uh, not too far right. from where I live, uh, some close friends of mine have have seen the legendary Tasmanian tiger. Uh, it's supposed to have been extinct, but it was right there in their headlights. They were coming home about 10 p.m. at night, and right there, the the beam, the light beams caught the striped large uh, being, which the cryptozoologists here, uh, people like Rex Gilroy, talk about as the Tasmanian tiger. So. I'm really fascinated in, in your findings, Lon. Over the years, what are the cases that really stick out that you know really make you sit up and go, wow? Well, there have actually been a lot of them. I mean, I had a personal experience back in, uh, in 1988 that was somewhat similar to, uh, to the humanoid, flying humanoid sightings that occurred in Point Pleasant and what's going on now in Chicago. It was basically, it basically looked like what a Mothman is described as now. How close did you get to this creature? I, I guess we were about 40, 50 feet away from it. It was myself and two other people. What were the circumstances? How did you happen? Were you out there looking for this creature or just it just happened to show up? Well, I'll go ahead and, t and tell the story. Um... This was in the autumn of 1988, and I was contacted by a friend of mine who was a troop leader of a Boy Scout troop here in Pennsylvania. We happened to run into each other down in Baltimore, and he knew about my investigations for a while then. You know, he asked me, he said, you know, something's been going on at the old Camp Conewago, where there have been some boys that have reported hearing crying sounds, and some of the troops were actually so spooked that they packed up and left. So uh, he, he told me, he said he and a friend of his were going to go up to Camp Conewago that weekend and check out, camp out and check out what's been going on. So he asked me if I'd like to get involved. I said, yeah, I mean, I'll, you know, no problem. I'll come on up. And I wasn't really expecting to stay uh, the weekend, but I did bring my stuff along, so maybe I knew I was going to be staying anyway. So I met Andy and John, who were the two guys I met up at the campground. And, uh, you know, they asked me right off. I said, they're going to stay the weekend. Uh, if you don't mind, you know, do you mind staying? I said, no, I'll go ahead and stay. So we we went in and hiked about 500 yards or so into the woods where the little Conewaga and the main stream meet together. And we set up camp, set up three tents. By the time we got everything set up, it was about 7 o'clock in the evening. So we decided to stay near the camp that night. So the first night was fairly uneventful. This was a Friday night. Though I, I had a sense that Something was watching us. I, I don't know why. It's every once in a while, you know, everybody gets these thoughts or feelings that something may be watching them. So I decided to just keep my eyes open, keep my head clear, and keep an eye on things. Uh, it was a fairly thick area, a lot of a lot of wildlife. So um, the next morning, you know, we 
just stayed around the camp, didn't do much of anything at night. So the next morning, nice, cool, sunny, cool day. And uh, we sat down to breakfast when John asked if we heard footsteps and movement during the night. Now, Andy said he had gone straight to sleep and he hadn't heard a thing. But I, I had told him I heard some movement, but I just assumed it was one of those guys walking around. So we spent the day walking throughout the woods, walked several miles, checking around, to see if we saw anything up bizarre unusual and i wasn't even picking up any type of energy spirit energy or anything it was just really it was just really benign so we finally got back to the camp about 6 p.m and we were just sitting around talking about every little thing that came to our heads so later that night we were sitting around a fire we were talking about sports and such and and suddenly a scream ran out, wet, rang out west and upstream from our location. Now, I thought it sounded like an owl at first, but a few minutes later it happened again. And it distinctively sounded like a child screaming. I couldn't tell how far away it was, but uh, it, it lasted for several seconds and seemed to fade in and out. So we got up and walked a few yards into the woods expecting to hear the sound again. But, you know, it was quiet, so we went back and sat down for, and started talking again, I guess about another hour. You know, you hear all kinds of stuff in the woods. I mean, I've heard a lot of different types of animals, screaming, bobcats, bobcats, owls, and, uh, but it didn't sound close to that. It definitely sounded like a child. So, um, we decided to stay up for the entire evening. There was a full moon, and, uh. You know, much of the woods in the creek were, were visible. So about 1 o'clock in the morning, I was walking around the camp, walking perimeter to camp, when I suddenly felt something like, like, again, like something was watching me. I tried to get a fix on it, but I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't really tell where it was coming from. So I went back and I asked Sandy and John what they felt, and they started, we started walking deep, deeper into the woods toward the fork of the uh, creeks. Uh, so we walked about maybe 50 foot on the trail along the creek when, without warning, we recognized to our right a large, dark figure with bright red eyes standing in the middle of the creek. And suddenly this thing shot straight up in the air with an audible whooshing sound. Uh, a few seconds later, we heard another scream that seemed to fade as if it was moving away from us. You know, we didn't we didn't even get a chance to get a flashlight on this thing. By you know, by the time we noticed it and it took off, but it you know it was lit up enough by the moonlight that we could tell what it looked like. So we hurried back to the campsite and we compared thoughts. Andy was shook up and he didn't talk for several minutes until I prodded him for his recollection. John was surprisingly calm, and he estimated it was about six foot or so dark in color and seemed to have something extending from its back. I also noticed the structures on the back and commented that it reminded me of wings, but I wasn't really sure. Uh, we all agreed that it had bright red eyes and that it jettisoned so fast that we, like I said before, we weren't able to get our flashlights on it. So, um, Andy was freaked, so he wanted to spend the night in the administration building. And maybe come back and get the gear in the morning. He, John actually walked up with him. So I decided to stay at, at the camp myself. I, I wanted to see what was, was going on. I wanted to see this thing again. But, you know, it was really quiet that night. I really hadn't thought much about it until I actually wrote about this thing years later on the blog. And in 2008, I received an email from a man who lived about a mile downstream from the incident where we had our incident at Dick's Dam, which is a small dam that was built on the, strip on the creek. He stated that he had heard similar screams for many years and that the sounds continued to that day. So we're talking like 20 years. 
and not long after that, I got another email from a scout leader. And he told me, he, he stated that he wanted to tell me that a few of his boys in his troop had witnessed what they described as a dragon Ugh. that was six foot tall with wings and a tail, but it looked like it had fur or feathers. He said that the boys seemed serious, but, you know, he thought time. They were just playing, you know, you know, showing off. So he dismissed their claims until he read what I posted. So since that time, uh, since 2008, I have received five really solid reports of a similar type being along the uh, Conewaga Creek, which actually extends about 10 miles downstream and then further than that until it empties into the, uh, the Susquehanna River. And there, haven't been, there hasn't been a sighting. I haven't received a sighting for two years, but there have been some odd occurrences along the creek. So I don't know if it was that thing or something else. Now, is that creek in, in Maryland? No, it's in Pennsylvania. Oh, it's in Pennsylvania. Yeah, okay. this is in uh, this is in northern Adams and York counties. Pennsylvania figures in a lot of these stories. Uh, of course, Stan Gordon does a lot of research uh, over there, and and there's been a lot of sightings of various types of cryptids and and Sasquatch and, and, and UFO sightings. Do you have any theory about why that er- that state in particular gets so much activity? Well, it, it does get a, a lot of activity, and um, I don't know if it's because of the makeup of the geology or the way the state is, but there are there are particular hot spots in the state where a lot of activity occurs. But overall, the whole state has a fair amount of odd sightings and occurrences, and that's been going on since you know since all of history. You know, ever since man, uh, you know, the New World. I mean, there's been stuff going on here and reported since the 1700s the being that you saw it does resemble you know what you know little i know of it as one of those those mothmen and a feature of the mothman experiences in point pleasant was there seemed to be like a lack of a better term a psychic or a supernatural component where some of the witnesses in the days and weeks afterwards they would have odd dreams odd visitations that kind of thing did, did anything like that happen to you after the sighting no nothing like that i uh, you know i had just i basically had forgotten about it until i you know i, I you know I, it's not like i totally forgot about it but i was uh, i really didn't think much about it until i got you know started the blog, you know, I had taken a lot of stories over the years of different things, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I put it up when I put it up on the blog and I started getting some response. So, and of course I've known Stan since about the same time I started the blog, Stan and I were conversing with each other and, uh, you know, we've shared information since that time. So yeah, I, and you know these flying these flying beings, flying humanoids are not on uncommon in Pennsylvania. There are uh, there are sightings on a regular basis in certain areas, in particular uh, Butler County, Pennsylvania. The Butler Gargoyle sightings um, are f- actually they, they've been there have been several sightings within the past month. So, uh, whatever this thing is, it's, um, uh, it's starting to show itself again. Does it resemble like a gargoyle, like a medieval gargoyle or, or something along those lines? Yeah, it really does. The wings are bat-like. Uh, it's got some size to it. Uh, I'd say maybe five to six foot. The, uh, the face is somewhat... I don't know, almost like a gargoyle from what its descriptions are, but it's dark in color. It kind of reminds of a, it kind of reminds of a gargoyle. But you know, then again, uh, these sightings we've had in Chicago, a lot of them could be described as a gargoyle type being too. Yeah, the the Chicago uh, sightings are fascinating, uh, and I don't know if a video I've seen oh about two three years ago now. Uh, 
was legitimate or not, but it, it gave me pause for thought. Somebody at ground level happened to be looking up, and they uh, you might have seen this video, Lon. I'd like your input on it. I think they used a cell phone camera on this thing, and it looked like a large bat-like humanoid that was just zipping along, flying along, just not a care in the world. Uh, did you see that video? Is this the one that was near? Uh, uh, well, it was. there was a large Indian statue. Uh, is this the one that was in Chicago? It was in Chicago. It was in broad daylight. I don't really remember the, the okay. ground features. But, yeah, it looked kind of bat-like and, and, and large to me. But, you know, I'm not a photographic well, expert. I, I couldn't tell if it had been doctored or not. Well, the, the one sighting, uh, there were three sightings back in 2011. And one of the witnesses who actually was from Tasmania commented that when she saw it and took the picture of it, it looked like a, a large sugar glider. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I can't... Re it's hard to tell the size of the thing. Uh, it does look like it has some fairly decent size to it. But, if you know, looking at it, it does look like a sugar glider actually gliding through the sky. Uh, what is a sugar glider? It's, uh, well, an actual sugar glider is fairly small, but it's a, um, and I don't know if it's a marsupial or not, but it's, it's actually a, uh, a mammal that has wings and it glides from trees. Kind of like a bat fox or something like that. Something like that. Maybe like a, uh, flying squirrel or something similar. Uh-huh. What the heck is it doing in Chicago? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, that, but that's what it looks like. But again, it, it was at a distance, but the profile of it, it kind of did look like a, uh, a large sugar glider. You know how it is, uh, having these intuitive gifts that uh, a lot of times things have to manifest in the spirit world before it manifests in our physical 3D world. I have friends that are very gifted, and they go around doing house clearings where, where the residents are complaining about odd happenings and visitations and whatnot. And one of the creatures that shows up, but within the, the context of the creature being um, non-corporeal, interdimensional, is this bat-gargoyle-type creature. It's, the stories of this has come up again and again where they would come up across this bat-gargoyle-type creature that had taken up residence in someone's house, and then these psychics had to come in and, like, kind of ask it to leave or banish it in some way. And I'm wondering if the the physical 3D bat-type creature is some kind of physical 3D analog to that. It may very well be. I, I do believe this is an inter interdimensional flesh-and-blood being that's uh, coming from another location. I, um, I, I, I made note that these sightings in Chicago, there has also been subsequent large flashes of light south of the city that have been mm -hmm. reported. So I don't know if it has anything to do with that. But uh, I have had people tell me over the years uh, something to similar to what you're talking about. Where they would, you know, and a lot of time it started out where they would have these dreams of these flying humanoids, and they would speak to them, and occasionally these things would end up as real flesh and blood beings. Like and they had the coming to that coming to their house, yeah, yeah. Like they had the <clears throat> means to manifest in in, in our three D, yeah. and, and that's an aspect of the Sasquatch research that, you know, to this day is somewhat underplayed. Uh, the Native Americans for, for, you know, low these many centuries, they talk about what we would call an interdimensional or metaphysical aspect to at least some of the Sasquatch. They have the ability to appear, disappear, a bright flash of light, and then they're gone and open up a portal and walk through it or open up a portal and come out of it. So, you know, it again, it underscores this uh, idea that, this world is a lot more fluid, a lot more dynamic than we think it is. Yeah, I think that most cryptids, I mean, at this point, I think that most cryptid sightings, I'm talking about Mothman, Bigfoot, Dogman, Upright Canine, anything. 
I think for the most part that these are visitors from alternate universes. Now, in, in the case of Bigfoot and maybe some of the upright canines, there may be an indigenous group here and there, in particular, like the upper the upper uh, Pacific Northwest in, in uh, Washington, Northern California, Oregon, or some of the uh, swamp ape sightings down in, in the swamps in Florida and possibly Louisiana and such. I mean, that very well may be an indigenous group. But overall, I, I think most of the cryptid sightings are uh, some type of manifestation from another universe. Yeah, I, I feel the same way, Lon. I, re I read this book, uh, what was, it was about the Skinwalker Ranch or something there in Utah, right. and... And I, what I thought was funny, Lon, was these people, these scientist types, would show up with all their gear, and they, they kind of thought that they could get a read on what was going on there. But the entities or the intelligence there just ran rings around them and their, and their equipment. I would have come in with some mediums and psychics like yourself, you know. I mean, that's what I would have done. But one of the stories that emerged from that book was, I can't remember if it was the guy that lived at that ranch or. Or, or a sheriff or somebody, but there were these huge overgrown wolves that were hanging around, and they would open fire uh, with, with handguns, uh, revolvers, or, or pistols at, at these things with no visible effect. And they would track the, the, the prints of these things, and just as the case with, with Sasquatch on occasion, the tracks would abruptly stop. So I do believe there's an interdimensional component that... Perhaps these cryptids, because they have this etheric vision going on, they may be able to see where these portal entries and doorways are between their world and ours, and they just come and go like we come and go through, you know, um, through elevator doors. That's true. I mean, there, I have uh, had reports, many instances, and even seen uh, these tracks of Bigfoot-like creatures that just suddenly disappear. I mean, you know. It's like they take off somewhere. And um, the one aspect of the, the the upright canine sightings here in Pennsylvania, <clears throat> I don't know how it is other other places because I really haven't looked in to, you know, intently as far as I, the, the ones in Pennsylvania. But there there are no tracks anywhere that, that have ever been found. And... I'm not saying that the that these sightings are are not flesh and blood. I, I very well do think some of them are, but I think there is a supernatural ability to where they may be able to just move along the ground, even though it looks like they're they're actually walking, but they just don't leave tracks. Yes, and some of the flying humanoid type stories where. Sometimes they don't even seem to flap their wings. They just vertically just shoot straight up in the air without any yeah. whooshing sound or without any visible means of support. Yeah, that's uh, that's fairly common. Very rarely will I get a flying humanoid sighting where, I mean, while it's in the air that it's actually flapping wings, it's normally like it's being propelled by some means. and But the wings are usually unfurled, I mean, and spread out, but they're just gliding. You know what happens, too? We live in the age of the dig cam and, and, and the cell phone cam, so we can expect that people get more and more uh, photos and, and capture imagery of, of all these different creatures, and also with the means to uh, photo edit, uh, con uh, contrast, solarization, what have you, one is able, if they're adept enough, to, to bring out all kinds of details in an image which are not visible in the visible spectrum. But when you look at these solarized images, in our example, you can clearly see sometimes there's some kind of humanoid creature there, there's some kind of machine or something next to it. Um, a friend of mine had an aerial photograph taken of her, the home she used to live in. And just on a whim, she sent it to this gal who does a lot of these uh, photo editing, you know, with, with contrast and whatnot. And clear as day, after uh, the, this woman had worked on the photo, you could see a, a large, what looked like a pteranodon, 
flying over the house. But in the visible spectrum, it wasn't there. But just with a little tweaking of the of the contrast and then the solarization, voila, suddenly you see clear as day what could only be a, like a pteranodon or something. So it just, again, it underscores that our visual, visible spectrum, our visual spectrum is so limited. And, and thankfully, in your case, Lon, you can go to these places and you can pick up, you know, vibes and sensations in, in the environment around you. Well, I, I, I believe that certain people, for whatever reason, are predisposed to be able to see these beings. This thing going on in Chicago in particular, I mean, Chicago is a huge city. Some of these sightings have been in areas where a lot of people are around, but it just seems that certain people are seeing it. Another thing is that many of these witnesses that I have talked to tried to get digital photographs of these beings, but it was either, well, it would be either be too dark or it'd be too fast or it simply just did not show up in the film. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I, I have seen one digital photo that she swore she took it and there was nothing there maybe just a a, a small blur uh i mean it wasn't even worth looking at i mean there was nothing there but she swore she had it right in her sights so uh, you talked about it, it actually being in another spectrum to where certain people could actually detect it and others couldn't i, I think that may very well be true and yeah, I think that, yes. that's what's going on here with this uh, these sightings. And like you pointed out, we see the inverse of that, where sometimes people will take uh, photos and the object of, that they're taking is as plain as day, but it paradoxically doesn't show up on the imagery. This happened to a, a close friend of mine. Uh, she was having all these you know, unusual experiences, and she looked out her balcony window, and there, right in front of her house, was like an SUV and three guys standing around in dark suits and sunglasses, kind of very, kind of mib-like in some way. And then mm-hmm. when they noticed her, they they began walking slowly down the street, uh, accompanying the vehicle. The vehicle was driving slowly, and she took three photographs, Lon, and none of them showed anything. They just it only just showed the street, and she was absolutely certain she knew what she was looking at. Yeah, that's that that has happened. I mean, I have had witnesses that swore in the past that they have, uh, and this men in black thing, like you said, that that's common with that as well. I had a witness who had a similar situation up in Toronto where. These MIBs were were described as MIBs were walking through the neighborhood, and she was attempting to take images of these things, and <laughs> none of them came out. So, yeah, I mean, her and her boyfriend saw them, but it doesn't seem like anybody else. And this was right in a residential neighborhood. Nobody else seemed to notice them. Now, shifting gears and, and talking about some of the, the beings that are more indigenous, and, and I would agree with you, Alon, that some of these like swamp-type creatures, and also, you know, dear listeners, just remember that we live on the fringes of, of, of all this wilderness. So, like, we like to think that, you know, we're pioneers and we're, we're trailblazers, and we're not. It's There's so much trackless, still uncharted uh, woodland, uh, endless bogs and creeks all over the place and watching monsters and mysteries uh, uh in, in america yeah it struck me alon that, that some of these creatures in these swamps and bogs i could see how they've just been there all along and it's their habitat no one's going to root them out of it no one's going to go in there and kind of evict them as unfortunately happened with you know indigenous uh cultures on the surface and you know, what are some of the most interesting uh, types of woodland creatures or swamp creatures that you've you've studied in the past. These uh, upright canine settings in Pennsylvania have really been an interesting venture. I mean, for the last two years, for whatever reason, in in central Pennsylvania, there have been a lot of sightings of these um, these upright canines, and, and basically, their description is that of like. A wolf, I mean, a werewolf type of being, 
yeah. on two legs. I mean, uh, and they're being seen during the day and night, but mostly during the day. Wow. Yeah, so, uh, you know, a lot of times they've been seen on the sides of the road, crouched down eating roadkill, or uh, they would be standing on the side of the road just watching. It, I mean, it is a, they are fascinating, some of the sightings we've gotten. Some of them suddenly appear and then disappear. We've had witnesses who have encountered these beings in a forest or a clearing, and they'd be armed. But for whatever reason, they, they refused to use the weapon on them. They just simply back down and start backing away from them. Now, there have never been any attacks, but it seems like uh, there's some type of uh, ESP or something going on there where people just back away from them. And they don't back away from the people. They stand their ground. And they definitely get the impression that they're a sentient being, too, uh, a sovereign yeah. sentient being. And another thing also, uh, Lon, is it seems to me, and this is, could be me thinking this, but you know, even the term dogman seems to be an effort to move away from the whole werewolf wolf story. Is it almost as if you know these stories from the past would somehow taint, if you will, the you know the current research going on to on with these so-called dogmen? But the accounts I've read, the the drawings I've seen, they look kind of wolf-like to me. What we have run across are two type of uh, canine beings. The what we, what Butch and I referred to as the um, the dog man are are actually quadrupeds, and mm. they look like they do look like wolves, but they're they're a decent size, but uh, they're they take a form of like humanoid uh, as far as body shape. Uh, leg structure, but they are not, they are rarely seen on two legs. There have been others that kind of were on two legs, but kind of had a, a different look than the, what we call just the upright canines, which we have been experiencing, have been, people have been experiencing in central Pennsylvania. The, uh, those upright canines are always on two legs. They're huge. Their physique is that of a, a human, though it has hair, but uh, it also has the exaggerated thin waist and huge chest and arms and a huge head covered with hair and a snout just like a uh, like a wolf. They, are they ever seen in in packs? Like like we think of like coyotes and and wolves as being pack animals. Are they ever seen like two or more, or are they usually just seen singly? Yeah, these are so far all the reports that we have received of you know the past two years have been solitary. There have been historical sightings in certain parts of Pennsylvania where there were packs. Of these uh, dog, they call them dog man, but they were normally bipeds. And um, there was a one story where a um, a logging camp was raided by the that they called the dog man, but they were they were they were bipeds in uh, near North um, anyway, it's in Northumberland County, but that was back in the mid eighteen hundreds. And there had been others as well. There was one. There was a sighting of a um, a large pack back in uh, I think it was the early 1900s in Al with, with an area now of Allegheny State Forest. So yeah, there have been some sightings uh, south of Pennsylvania into Maryland. Uh, there were uh, there was a large flap of sightings in Frederick County, Maryland, back in the um, late 50s, early 60s. There were seven documented sightings of these upright canines, and um, those were pretty similar to what we're getting in central Pennsylvania now. Pennsylvania in general must be one big vortex, interdimensional area. I had a dream not too long ago, Lon, where you remember those, well, this is... 
the digital cams and whatnot totally wiped out the old, pretty much the old photography business. But remember those photo drive ups where you drive, you drive up and and you leave some film and you come back later and pick up your your prints. Well, in this yeah. dream, I was sitting like in a little room, in the center of a of a big avenue, and it reminded me of those those photo drive up type places. And I remember looking out the window and there was like a park uh, nearby and I saw a whole horde of these upright canine beings and they had to be like seven, eight foot tall, very big and broad in the shoulders and like what you described, thinner around the waist and then their legs, you know, were, were kind of humanoid looking but also very canine looking and they were walking along and what was interesting, Lon, was there was pedestrians that were crossing the street with them that didn't seem to notice them, right? They were just walking along mm-hmm. like they didn't have a care in the world, but interspersed amongst them was like like a dozen or more of these huge canines that were kind of walking along. And when I woke up and I thought about it the next morning, I thought, well, you know, is that a metaphor? What does it mean? Does it mean that more of them are coming? And do you get the impression, Lon, that is a is there an uptick an upsurge in activity and b if so what what does it potentially portend what do you think it means well see that's a question I, we've been trying to answer now for at least the last 20 years i believe is uh, why are people seeing more of these beings for the most part and why is the activity seem to be picking up i i believe that you know the standard, the standard uh, saying is the veil is thinning. Yes. I think that very very well may be true. I think they have proven that there are certain number of dimensions other than our Earth, our Earth plane. Uh, I believe that there are alternate worlds where if some type of wormhole gateway or whatever opens up, that beings from this planet and from other, I mean, from this Earth plane and other alternate realities can move about. And I think that's what's going on. And for whatever reason, why it's happening, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I, is, it, is it something that we're doing to uh, allow this to happen or... Is this something that's going on on the other side that's causing it to open up? I, I just believe that it, it, you know people are also more aware of their surroundings now. Quite frank with you, I mean, I used to be a, a really avid hunter when I was younger, and I used to practically live in the woods and in the, in the outdoors. But I, I really would think twice about even going into the woods anymore. Because all the strange things that people have been encountering, there just seems to be a lot of energy out there that didn't used to be there. Some places, some uh, stretches of geography have been scarred by like these tremendous battles. I mean, I'm a student of the American Civil War too, so I, you know, I mean, right. Antietam and, and and Gettysburg, those were horrific battles, and you know, we've heard stories of like motorists. <laughs> pulling over because they think they're seeing a reenactment, right? But really, it's these these spirits or whatever caught in time that, that because the emotion was so highly charged at that time and because there was blood and carnage all over the place, something happened where things were frozen kind of in place. And, you know, we see the, uh, the inverse of that also, uh, uh, Lon, mm-hmm. where all these creatures seem to be coming over into our side of the veil, but every once in a while we hear these curious stories of, well, like, for example, people seeing, uh, finding themselves in, in, in a Gettysburg environment where everything seems to be real, or they're somewhere in, in the plains, the northern plains, and suddenly you know, they're about to be stampeded by, by Lakota uh, uh, Indians from, like, centuries ago. So things like that are beginning to happen where there's these weird time anomalies going on where someone will, you know, be driving along, they'll look over and they'll see, uh, you know, people moving along in a horse and buggy dressed in period clothes. And they're looking at each other like, you know, WTF, what's going on, you know? And then a little further down, and then they begin to notice that, you know, normal landmarks that they see every single day 
just aren't there. Like they just wound up in an entirely different place. Yeah, I do. I do get a lot of reports that are similar to that. It, it does seem that people just, you know, are just tr- are moved to other times or other eras. And I mean, there are some people that just happens to you all the time. Yes, this is true. And I, you know why? I mean, why it's happening? I, you know, I, I really don't have an explanation. All I got is like everybody else theories. And uh, but it does seem that. Like I said before, you know, there is more energy. In particular, look at the, you know, you're talking about Gettysburg. Now, when I was a kid and I used to spend a lot of time on the battlefield, you know, I, I would have experiences. I used to I used to actually sneak on the battlefield at night and camp out. And uh, I'd really come across a lot of weird things that happened. But, you know... Over the years, I, ha- I go back there, and I still now I moved back to my my child childhood home. So you know I'm near there again, and I have gone over to the battlefield several times, and uh, you know it, it, it's the energy that I felt before is magnetized. It, uh-huh. it, it really no, it magnified. It really has. It's it's much stronger. It, it's hard to describe. It's you know I in particular there's a certain certain place on the battlefield that just it, it just seems to me I'm I'm moved to another era uh, the area behind Little Round Top where the 20th Main yes. monument's at I have I am drawn to that location now it's been it's been renovated the past couple of years but. Every time I go back there, I get, you know, it's almost, I've got to sit down. I can't stand. It's almost like I'm being taken away. Uh, why that's going on, I don't know. I have been told, and I don't know how true this is, that I had a past life and I died there. I don't know. You know, and it's ha- I've had other odd things happen in different areas of the battlefield, but that that area right there in particular, it just seems to, uh, you know, I go back or I'm ready for about anything. Now, do you get the feeling uh, internally that you're more drawn to, you know, the Joshua Chamberlain 20th Main side of things or more to, like, the Alabamans charging up the hill? I mean, what... No, what's... it's definitely on the northern side. The northern it really side. really is. It's, yeah, yeah. It's not going up the hill. It's, it's being on top of the hill waiting. Yeah, oh, I can imagine. It, you know, like the, that movie Gettysburg. It, it it was a really good movie, but if if they made a movie about what it was really like, and how could we even imagine having to fire those those single shot muskets where you have to take the time to to, to cram the the ball down the uh, the barrel and all the time these rebels are charging up the hill it's just you know today nowadays people have like multiple round magazines and stuff and back then they had to just go through this whole step procedure just to fire off a round that to me is astonishing and and the fact that they made that stand there and then after all that they they made a charge down the hill when they ran out of ammunition it's like it, it's the stuff of legend is what it is well it, it... To me, it's got more energy than any area on the battlefield, and I've been all over the battlefield, and that and that particular spot has gotten more energy to me than any place on that on that battlefield. It's uh, you know, it seems that areas that were involved in the second day of the three day battle yes. seem to be have stronger energy. Yes, like Devil's Den. Did, did you go around there, and what, is, what does that feel like? And why it's would bad. they call it I mean, Devil's Den anyway? Yeah, I can't even go up on top on top of the rocks anymore. It, it bothers me so bad. Culp Hill's the same way. I can't. I have issues at Culp Hill as well. It, it does. The second day, the, the areas where there were more action on the second day, to me, just seemed to. I don't know. It's it's just it's palpable. It really is. It you know, there's just so much energy in that battlefield. And I, and I, I tell you, to me, it's gotten stronger. It's not waned off at all. 
Well, we were just talking earlier about how Pennsylvania seems to be a highly energized state to begin with. You know, inter- interdimensional vortexes from here to there. <clears throat> and then when you have this tremendous battle, which it, it's amazing that a battle that happened that far north anyway, Lon, it's, it's like this weird confluence of events where, where Lee's army was coming down from the north <laughs> and, and Meade's army was coming up from the south. Everything was inverted. And of all places, they meet there. Right uh, in that in that mountainous terrain outside of Gettysburg, even even how this the battle developed was very strange when one one takes the time to study it. it it's almost like it was destiny to, to turn around there. You're right. I mean the circumstances to you know even days before just seemed to add on to why. It ended the way it did, uh, in particular, like I live in Hanover, where there was a battle here in Hanover two days before, or the day before the first day of uh, Gettysburg. Jeb Stewart's cavalry was the eyes and ears of Lee's, Lee's army, and they got thwarted and sent towards the east here in Hanover by Custer's and uh, uh, Kilpatrick's Calvary, Calvary and infantry, uh, which made them unable to go to Gettysburg and report troop, Union troop movement for, for two days. Yes. So, uh, I mean, that was one circumstance. There were, there were a, lot of, <clears throat> a lot of other strains. I mean, it seemed like even though the North was invaded, it, it seemed like to all go around that area and then converge there. And as the North was coming north, you know, into... Into, back into Pennsylvania from Maryland, they just seemed to start congregating at one time. It was it was, it is if you you study if you study the battle, it's uh, it's really amazing how it it started and how it progressed over those three days. It was almost if I didn't know any better, and that was a key point of the battle because you know the lore of it, well known, is that Jeb Stuart's cavalry was not there to help the the main confederate army <laughs> scout the ground uh, locate the position of the, the 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 main federal army it was almost if i didn't know any better lon it was almost as if that that land that mystical land that highly energized land drew those people there uh fr- from both sides to, to create that terrible conflict well this has been a fascinating first half and we we're just getting started folks Lon, uh, how would uh, our listeners uh, get a hold of you? Yeah, they can go to the blog at uh, phantomsandmonsters dot com, and I have uh, I have uh, links there where people can click on to contact me, or you can send me an email at Lon Strickler at phantomsandmonsters dot com, or you can uh, call me. My phone number is there at reader information, and to uh, report a sighting and an encounter. You've been listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show with our very special guest, Lon Strickler, and we're just getting started. Uh, This is the end of the first hour, and we'll see you at the top of the next hour. We'll be right back.